It is great to be here for another Tuesday edition of Iowa Hawkeyes live right here at the Voice of College Football with just over two months left to go until we <laughs> make our way to, I don't know if anyone could hear that, hopefully only me, but uh, we get a little reverb working there for a minute. Okay, reset. Iowa Hawkeyes live right here at the Voice of College Football on another Tuesday. Good to be here. And, uh, of course, June, uh, an important month for recruiting, and Iowa has stepped up to the plate and signed, received five commitments, signing in December, of course, received five commitments here in the last week. Corey Bratta from the Hawkeye of the Storm, that's your place to be, folks, each and every day, and we're moving in on Big Ten Media Days in just about a month and uh, about five weeks away from August camp. Corey, how you doing? Doing good, Mark. I'm up update at, right now. I'm updating your. Uh, we got to update your title to your uh, your stream here because uh, uh, I, I, you've got Kennedy and uh, Eben. I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that we do all these guys justice. Uh, five guys since we went live last week, as you said, and uh, yeah, was, we knew it was gonna be a busy week because uh, you know a bunch of official visits over the weekend. So I'm not shocked by uh, having all these guys uh, added. When they when they added when, when they decided to commit, I'm not I wasn't shocked by it, but I am a little bit surprised they all came so soon after the weekend. Uh, I, I guess that's a good thing. I mean, none of these guys, none of them, were these highly sought after kids, with the exception maybe being Gavin Hoff, uh, Hoffman from uh, Overland Park, uh, number one Kansas in the, uh, number one Kansas number one tight end in the state of Kansas, did have offers from four SEC schools, three other Big Ten schools. Uh, and then a Pac-12 school and a Big 12 school. So good high major tight end uh, was considered a three-star recruit. There were no four stars in here. But uh, Gavin, if you watch him on tape, there you can see why he was being pursued by the bigger names out there. Um, but the class as a whole, Mark, has come together nicely, and they've really secured the border. I mean, the state of Iowa has been dominated by Iowa. And if I'm an Iowa State fan, I know that uh, Cyclone fans will – come back and say, well, who cares about two and three star kids? Well, you kind of have to secure the border to have success in this state. I mean, you just have to. And state of Iowa recruiting has improved drastically over the past decade. And guys like Reese Vanderzee, he's a guy that Iowa State wanted. Uh, you know, he's 6'5", 190 out of a small school, Central Lion, and Iowa's done very well up in Rock Rapids with Zach Lutmer, um, with uh, Graham Eben yesterday, and now with Reese Vanderzee. And obviously, Iowa needs help at that position, and Iowa State's had more success at that position. Nebraska, another one. They've been in the mix on almost all these guys, Mark. Both of the tight ends that committed to Iowa in the past week, both guys had been offered by Nebraska. Um, Nebraska typically throws out more offers than Iowa does, although it's a new regime with with uh, a new coaching staff. So, no, po all positive. All positive. They are really going to be deep at tight end. Um, they have added enough guys early where I think you can kind of sit back and feel pretty good about where you're at at tight end, especially with who they added late in the process this past year with Grant Leeper and, you know, adding Eric all in via the transfer portal. Um, they have just done very well at that position. I give you Abdul Hodge a lot of credit. A guy who's never coached tight ends um, is doing well right now on the tight end circuit. So, um, yeah, they've, they've done well. There still needs, Mark. Wide receiver still in need. I know Vander Zee's a commit, but they need more athleticism. They need speed. They need quickness. And that's not the first time we've said that. Yeah, I was uh, doing my best to find statistics on these players. Gavin Hoffman was the one that I could track down. He runs a 4.56.40. Uh, his junior season included uh, 39 receptions, 713 yards, and 11 touchdowns for Gavin Hoffman. The others I was not able to track down any stats from their junior seasons. But uh, – Four, yeah, five, six, 40. Four, five, six, 40 for Gavin Hoffman for a six foot five, 220 pound tight end, Mark. Mm, yeah. So, you know, he's he's uh, he's got a chance to be really good. I mean, I watched him on tape and I'm surprised he's ranked nationally as low as I mean, you're, you're what are you looking at? Two, four, seven. They've got him at 980th overall in the country. Again, I'm no expert by looking at, you know, eight minutes of tape. But the way he runs, the way he catches, he's got really soft hands. I mentioned in a video that was posted about an hour ago, he runs like a receiver at 6'5", 220, and that's always intriguing. And I know we love doing 
comparisons and and flashing back to greats and trying to compare a, a guy who's not proven anything to an all-time great. So I guess we'll do that. I look at the way Gavin Hoffman runs and catches, and it reminds me a little bit of a guy like Noah Fant. And both of those guys came in are coming in around the same size. Now, Gavin may, you know, he may not be 220 when he gets to Iowa, but I think uh, Noah Fant, when he got here, was like 6'5", 210. So, uh, you know, not saying he's got the athletic upside of a guy who ended up being a first-round draft pick and a starter in the NFL, but he's got that type of uh, smoothness in how he plays the game of football. Uh, he is what I look at and think, okay, he, he's got an opportunity to be a really good pass-catching tight end. Uh, you know, his ability to block at this level, who knows? You know, Noah Fan, I don't think, was ever known as a great blocker at Iowa. Uh, you see Gavin Hoffman uh, down at uh, uh, Overland Park basically throwing guys around. I even mentioned on my, my short breakdown, you know, he gets low, but I don't know that he's got the best fundamentals. He hasn't shown that on tape that I've seen but he'll be taught that at Iowa and given his athleticism, he's a really good basketball athlete. He's got the tools. I mean, this is a really good land for Iowa. Um, and like I said, uh, Michael Burt too. I mean, here's a guy six foot six two forty that they landed less than a week ago, Mark. So uh, we've, we've been talking about the tight ends. Ironically enough, I cut out a video from a live stream on, on uh, Sunday about the tight ends because I know uh, Brad Heinrichs of the swarm kind of reiterated. I want to say that I don't want to, try to go quote for quote on this, but basically told me and, and said it on our show that uh, Kirk Ferentz had recently made a comment to Brad that he thinks the tight end room has a chance to be better this year than it was last year, which I don't have any reason to question Brad's honesty. If that's a comment from the coaching staff, that's quite a comment because I know the coaching staff loved Sam Laporta and Sam Laporta is turning heads at Detroit right now. Um, but if that's the case, boy, look at the, look at the depth they have over the next couple of years. And uh, yeah, I mean, you want that would be the one question mark when Abdul Hodge got hired is eh, you want to, you know, you're tied in you, so maybe you can get away with it. But is that really, I mean, you you would have to think Iowa had a chance of landing a big name like a, a Brewster or someone who's known for coaching tight ends instead of a guy who's a former linebacker like Abdul Hodge, but so far so good. And obviously, he's he's doing okay in the recruiting trail. You brought up the commitment list, so past the rankings, and again. I would expect with Gavin Hoffman in particular, and that's the commitment list that we have on the screen right now, that we're going to see his ranking jump uh, because the commitments typically really show you, you know, if there are these type of schools that have offered, you know, you mentioned all the teams in the Big Ten and the SEC, you know, we're talking about Tennessee in particular, Auburn, Arkansas, and then the schools from the Big Ten, including uh, a few from the Big Ten Western Division. It's just a, you, you would think that, uh, you know, this is this is a guy that uh, is being wanted elsewhere by top 25 programs. So Ga Gavin Hoffman in particular, just based on the commitment list, those are good indicators for me. Yeah, the guy, I think it, there's no question about it. He's probably the guy to be most excited about. But Devin Kennedy had a good offer list too, Mark. I mean, he had a chance to go to Penn State where his dad, you probably remember Jimmy Kennedy that played at Penn State, ended up being a first-round draft pick. Um, so his dad was a Nittany Lion. I don't know, certainly don't claim to know anything about Devin's relationship with Jimmy. Um, but, I, you, you know, you kind of do furrow your brow a bit. Like Penn State offered, and and here his dad was a superstar at Penn State, and he's not, he's going to Iowa. Um, so I'd love to talk to Devin. Hopefully we'll get a chance to chat with him at some point. He's got tremendous upside. Just started playing football a year ago and uh, didn't even accumulate that many stats last season down at Brophy College Prep in Phoenix, but uh, has gotten some some high major offers. And I, I give Iowa credit. A guy like this could end up piling on the offers, but you know, but time summer's over and uh, to get a pledge from him early doesn't mean guys can't decommit, flip, etc. But uh, good on the coaching staff for getting that one done. Corey just started playing football. So are we looking at a track athlete? You know, that's a good question. I, I, I have not talked to Kennedy. Uh, I did read a little bit more about him. I know the guys over at on three, Tom Caker and company, they've, they've written stuff about uh, Devin. These commitments have come in so fast. I, I can hardly keep up with them, but I mean, go down and go down to the full offer list, Mark for Devin. So I mentioned Penn state, you see Illinois there. Yes. He's got some mid major FCS offers, Oregon state offered as well. And all those offers came here recently um, and then, you know, generated some interest from some high major schools like Kansas State. So, 
you know, a kid like that, really good upside. He's got seven foot wingspan. I mean, he's a six foot three and a half kid with a seven foot wingspan. Hmm. My guess is he does not end up playing on the outside at Iowa. My guess is he is an inside interior guy. Uh, you know, if he can, he's packed on. I, I think Sean Baca, two four seven Sports, wrote recently that he's added like forty pounds in the last couple of months. So, you know, guys like that, I was really done a nice job in twenty three and twenty four adding raw athletes. I think that would be my biggest takeaway, at least so far from these two classes. None of which have we haven't seen any of those players play on the field or be developed at Iowa, and they could fall through. A lot of them could flake out. But uh, or flame out, I should say. But I mean, I can Grant Leaper, uh, Dayton Howard. Um, I mean, just go down the list. Kenneth Merriweather, like these really good, impressive athletes. Will they fit into a role at Iowa? Will they acclimate? Will they are they willing to put in the work, be developed? What kind of competitors are they like? You know, Devin Kennedy, Michael Burt. I mean, I compared Michael Burt with just what he looks like on the football field to a CJ Fedorowicz. I mean, he's a Big, big dude at six foot six, 240 pounds for a tight end who's still got another year of high school in front of him. But it doesn't mean he's going to end. I mean, it doesn't mean he's going to end up being a starter like CJ was. So um, they've done nice, a nice job within the state of Iowa. They've gotten some raw guys from outside the state that were wanted by other schools, which is an indicator that uh, it's not just an Iowa eye that, that the coaching staff has. Now the question is, as it always is, can they go land some skill position talent? I mean, just just start at the top of this commitment list, Mark, and just you tell me if you see a theme. Go to the top of the list and just slowly scroll down. Tell me if you see a theme with all these guys. Cody Fox, Derek Weiskopf, Weiskopf Cam Buffington, Will Nolan. So you got offensive line, linebacker, linebacker, offensive line. Keep going. Then you've got Drew Campbell. Obviously, Jack's brother, James Reeshart, quarterback, really good ad. Bodie McCaslin, offensive line. Brevin Dahl, Des Moines uh, running back. Preston Reese, where he ends up fitting in. He's considered an athlete, but he's a Monticello kid. Xavier Williams, really good bruiser back from uh, Indiana. Reese Vanderzee, wide receiver from Rock Rapids. Hoffman, Janowski, uh, Devin Kennedy, Michael Burt. What's the what's the common theme with all those guys, Mark? Okay, as I, I look through that. And I was taking into account, obviously, off the top of the board, we're looking at offensive linemen and I believe it was linebackers. But what what stands out as I review all this, not knowing anything about any of these players, I had never heard of any of them prior to them committing to Iowa. And I'm I'm not a recruiting guy, but I talk a ton of recruiting throughout the the weeks uh, with all these schools. So I, I do have a lot of names in my head. Uh I'm looking at length. All of these guys are That's fair. They're tall. They're Very long. True. Very true. Yeah. I, I thought the same thing, especially with wide receiver. You know, you'll get Vander Z and he was an in-state kid at six foot five. Let's not forget, Mark, that they just added last year, they j- added Jacob Bostic, who's six foot two. This year they added Dayton Howard, who's six foot five, who's a receiver. Jarrett Bowie out of Tampa's six foot three. Um I think they need quick. I think they need to target more quickness, speed, athleticism. I'm not saying that Vander is not an athlete. I'm not saying that any of those other guys don't know how to run. But as Don Patterson has stated numerous times on my show, sometimes a wide receiver's height is overhyped. And I was gotten. Like, I keep hearing this prototypical X receiver. Okay, well, how many prototypical X receivers does Iowa need? Um, they are in on a number of other. Um, kids one of which i know it was projected by almost every outlet that really hits these kids hard in recruiting projected by almost every outlet to come to iowa and that's kj parker from elmhurst illinois um he's gotten you know his crystal balls and his whatever else those different outlets call him um but he's got he, cincinnati i know is in on him hard he's a kid at, at 511 with good quickness that uh, it'd be nice to land. But I was also, I mean, they've, they've thrown out offers to the big names at wide receiver, Mark. But as you know, it's pretty hard to convince a wide receiver to come to Iowa, especially a kid out of high school. You're not going to be throwing a lot of NIL offer, not a lot of NIL opportunity at a random kid in high school. I mean, maybe if he's a five-star kid, maybe. But even so, a lot of these kids have opportunities to make a lot of money at schools that offenses don't suck. And like, that's just the reality of it, Mark. They offered, I'm looking at uh, their offer list. 
They offered Ryan Wingo. He's a five-star kid out of St. Louis. Uh, they're not going to get him. He's got offers from uh, Georgia, Michigan, Missouri, Bama, Texas. They're not going to get him. Uh, they got an offer in on uh, Cam Williams, who's a four-star kid. He just committed to Notre Dame last uh, – uh, well, actually, no, he committed to Notre Dame a long time ago, but they offered him. Jeremiah McClellan, get out of St. Louis, a four-star kid. He's got crystal balls to Ohio State, got offers from LSU, Oregon. I mean, they don't stand a chance against those schools at receiver, Mark. They don't. And that's why it was so impressive that they were able to land Caleb Brown out of the transfer portal, and that's why I keep saying – the, the collective is more important than people think because Caleb Brown had an opportunity to go to other SEC schools. That is why his, how he pans out at Iowa is so important. Mark, if Caleb Brown, the Ohio State former four-star kid, if he fails at Iowa, if he, if, if he ends up in the transfer portal in a year or his career isn't anything special, that will be a disaster for Iowa on the recruiting trail at wide receiver. They were already tre- trying to tread water here. And so, I mean, yeah, look at that. These are the, those two first guys I mentioned are the top two receivers in the class, right? Am I looking at this correctly? Yes. This is the number one, or this is the uh, receiver rankings for 2024. Okay. So Ryan, I guess Ryan Wing- Wingo is the one that we were talking about a five-star yes. who's, who has not yet committed, but he's projected to, to Georgia. So yeah, I give Iowa, I'll never, never, uh, harp on the Iowa coaching staff for offering a kid they probably don't have a chance with. Like if they're confident with sure. character, there's no big question marks. They've they're a program changer. Why not give them a call and say, "Hey, we'd love to have you for a visit and we want you to t- we want you to come here. Uh, we'd like to get to know you better and we're ready to offer you a full ride scholarship." That's all you got to do, right? I know it's easier said than done. I have no problem with Iowa doing that. It doesn't take much time or effort. But at the same time, you got to be realistic. Iowa's done that. I mean, guys like KJ, uh, what's his face? KJ uh, Parker, obviously Vanderzee, who they landed uh, earlier today. Those are more reasonable additions. It's going to be hard for if Caleb Brown can have a, a big season and and Cade McNamara and him can develop chemistry. Maybe the tide can turn a little bit. But Kelton Copeland has struggled. There was no question about it. He struggled to land the big names. And even when he's landed the semi big names like Keegan Johnson, Arlen Bruce, Charlie Jones, they're not with the program anymore. So, you know, that's that. So I wonder why Iowa offered those two receivers. It must've been proximity. One was an Illinois kid that went to Notre Dame, or at least is committed at this point, Cam Williams. And then the other one was Missouri. Full Wingo. disclosure, too, for anybody that doesn't know me, I'm not following every offered guy that they throw out there. If I see an offer on social media, I'll, you know, like it or retweet it, Mark. But I'm like you. I, I got another, uh, there's enough guys doing that. There's enough recruiting guys who are following these guys and, you know, letting us know when they go in the bathroom and, hey, he just flushed. Like, we, you know, we don't need, I don't need to reiterate that stuff. There's plenty of guys on that. Yes. On, in that market. And so when guys commit, then I start, or when guys visit, I should say, I start looking at these kids more, but uh, my guess is you're right. Proximity. It's not hard to, to throw an offer and say, Hey, you want to be close to home or a few hours from home and, and help us change the program. Some is something here. And, and you brought up Caleb Brown, Caleb Brown success or would be success and how important that's going to be. Something needs to turn for this program at that position because as we go down the list, nobody expects Iowa to be competing with Ohio State, Georgia, whomever else for the best wide receivers in the country. But we're going sifting into the 50 or 60 range, and we're seeing Purdue pop up twice, Nebraska pop up twice. And Those are the schools they got to compete with. <laughs> yeah. You, you got to be able to recruit with the likes of Purdue at receiver. And that's hard. But Purdue also, listen. Purdue is no longer the Purdue that develops Heisman finalist receivers. Like there's no reason to think they're going to be able to continue. I mean, I guess I shouldn't say there's no reason to think that, but their head coach is coaching at Louisville. So I perceive Purdue completely in a different light than I did a year ago at this time, but you're right. I mean, Nebraska's proven nothing. Purdue has proven nothing with their coaching staff. Uh, What's Illinois proven at receiver. Those are the types of, uh, programs that I was battling right now at that position. 
And there, Minnesota's got a commit from the 92nd rated wide receiver out of Indiana. Yeah. Well, and so. let's, Minnesota's, but Mark, Minnesota is sort of known for wide receiver play. They are known, let's be honest, Minnesota's known for skill position play, Mark. As crazy as that sounds, because they don't score a ton of points, but they have had really good receivers, tight ends, and running backs in the past five to six years. They have. Yeah, they have. And, and here's here's a Nashville, Tennessee wide receiver, number 114, going to Indiana. And then we have Reese Van Der Zee show up. Now, once you get to the ranking of 114 versus 117, you know, who cares? Uh, you got to go with whom you believe is a better fit. And obviously, Reese Van Der Zee is an Iowa kid, so that, that makes a lot more sense. But uh, I would offer Charlie Becker, by the way. The kid that went to Indiana, they he they did offer him. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah. I mean, like I said, my, my big thing with all of these kids at receiver is do does Iowa have the coaching staff to develop those kids? Right. I mean, I know that's I know that's kind of simplifying things, but isn't that the real question here, Mark? Like, that's the question. Charlie Jones. You could argue they found a diamond in the rough a kid who was largely unknown, did Iowa develop him into what he was? I tend to think no. <laughs> based on based on history, I, I tend to think that he was better than Iowa made him out to be or made him look on offense. And Purdue made him look maybe a little bit better than he was. But the point is, like, they've had guys, like I said, Keegan Johnson, um, Arlen Bruce, who are three slash four star kids who had moments, but then again, they're they've up and left. Um, and so, I mean, the guys they have a lot of good character guys. Jared Bowie seems like a good kid. Alex Moda, good kid, Iowa kid, wants to win, no question about it. Big Hawkeye fan, wants to win. Reese Vanderzee, big Hawkeye fan. Like if Alex Moda and Reese Vanderzee are lined up on each on one side of the field in two years. Those guys are going to bleed black and gold and want to do everything they can to be electric. But guess what, Mark? So is a guy opposite of them, and they got to be developed. And I just – that's a big question mark. Does Iowa – does can Iowa develop wide receivers? We've not really seen that since this wide receiver coach or coordinator took over. Who is the last Iowa wide receiver – Charlie Jones aside, because he went to Purdue, but to spend his entire career at Iowa and play in the NFL, Smith Marset. Yeah, yeah, Smith Marset. Yeah, good call. Brandon Smith, Smith Marset, both left after 2020. I think they've both. Uh, Smith Marset's had more than a, uh, you know, a breather in the NFL, but both neither guy has really played. I mean, you could say the same thing about Marvin McNutt. Look at how productive he was, and had kind of a gaffe with Carolina on special teams one year and just never really got a shot to get back in DJK like that. Talk about, about a weird situation. We won't spend this day talking about Darrell Johnson, Cooley that dude, mm. <laughs> we actually, we should, we should spend like 30 minutes sometime and we can just talk about Darrell Johnson, Cooley Cause that is one of the weirdest situations in Iowa football history. Well, I'm going to have to do my homework. I just remember him and watched him play, but I don't know what the, the story is. You do your homework, Mark. <laughs> we need to spend time talking. I'm, about I'm, boy, I'm burned out on homework, which, by the way, since we're on the subject, and Daniel did mention it in our comments section, just released in the last half hour to 45 minutes are my Big Ten wide receiver rankings. So Iowa fans, don't rush over there to check out my wide receiver rankings because you may be waiting a long time to hear any Iowa wide receivers listed. So how far did you go down? I, I did a top 10, but I did about 10 or 12, at least 10 or 12 other wide receivers. So Ragaini didn't even make I it. I, I was going to mention him. I did not. I mentioned Caleb Brown. You mentioned Caleb Brown, Mr. I haven't done anything over like fifth year veteran Ragaini. I mentioned him as wow. somebody who could. Okay jump out and and do something yeah i don't have anything against that i think that's interesting but rocky Annie is here correct and kayla brown has yes proven nothing but we know what rocky Annie generally is kayla brown could elevate past him could could yeah <laughs> absolutely 
So what is this the year of in the Big Ten, Mark? Like in recent time, we've had the year of the quarterback, we've had the year of the wide receiver, and we've had the year of the running back, right? Like it seems like every year we've had a different skill position player that's really been, is it tight end? Is it the year of the tight end this year with what Iowa's got, with what Michigan's got? Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, Purdue Ohio State's lost, loaded at tight end. Purdue lost They're their loaded tight. everywhere, pretty much. Payne Durham's gone. Yes. Uh, uh, ru- running back is great. Big Ten running backs are great. Yeah, and I and I will could run. be part of. Yeah. I, Caleb Johnson could be great this year. He's got a chance of being could great. Be. I got more faith in Iowa being able to turn the corner and be really, really good at running back than I do at wide receiver. We'll say that. I almost had Caleb Johnson in my top 10, but then I remembered somebody else that I liked better. So I knocked him out at the last minute, but he almost. How many different positions have you done now? I've only done the quarterbacks, wide receivers, and running backs. When are you going to do tight end, Mark? Okay, let's do tight end. Make Iowa feel good. (laughs) Hey, is there's no question that Luke Lachey and Eric All are both Probably, well, they're most certainly top 10 guys. In, in oh, Vegas. yes. Both of them they're, are. They're both in the top four or five. Yeah. If not the, the two of the three best. Something that, that, will make, that will make Iowa fans feel a little better. Yes. Uh, this was not a series I was intending on doing, but um, I didn't even really do the quarterbacks, come to think of it. I did a national quarterback look, and I only had one quarterback from the Big Ten in the top 10 just because, well, I... Did I do a quarterback? Anyway, I may have at one point. Yes, I did. That's right, because we talked about Cade McNamara. I don't think it's a good quarterback year in the Big Ten. You don't think it's a good year? In the, I do not. Really? As well, it stands I, I, right it's now. Young. It's young. It could be really, really good. Look, It at could be. The potential at Ohio State and Penn State, those oh, two yeah. guys could be Heisman candidates by the season's end. I mean... They've got that type yes. of upside, and I've talked a long, long time about Cali McManus. You've talked about what you've heard about Jeff Sims. I mean, a lot of these are things we've heard. Uh, yeah, so there's question marks. No question about it. I got big questions. Who's playing quarterback at Illinois? Well, I believe it's going to be Luke Altmeyer, the Ole Miss transfer. Yeah. And his backup, pretty would, good. would his backup be the Rutgers kid? Oh, uh, Sitkowski? Yes. Sitkowski? Arthur Sitkowski. Yes. Great name. That Rutgers outfit. It's it's an interesting uh, football program. Where are they at right now? They have uh, reached a level where Greg Schiano has raised their floor to a, I don't want to call it a respectable level, but at least where they're going to, you know, unlike Northwestern in the last two years, beat FCS and group of five teams and then get slaughtered in the big 10, but at least they're, they can field a team, you know, they can field a defense, but the, the offense is still horrible. Uh, Indiana's got a bad quarterback situation or an inexperienced quarterback situation. And Rutgers is awful at the position. Let me further clarify what I said earlier. The big 10 has a chance to be, exceptional at quarterback not just good exceptional they do i mean we're talking about two we're talking about penn state and ohio state we didn't even mention jj mccarthy and talia tagavailoa those two guys could be i mean their upside is extremely high as well um i don't i I think we know what we have with Cade mcnamara which is iowa fans probably are happy about but like those other guys all four of those guys that we just mentioned have an opportunity to be fantastic. And then Jeff Sims with his ability to create with his legs and a new coaching staff. Can you please read Gary Barta's lost spine in his comment, Mark? Gary Barta's lost spine. Earlier, he wanted us to predict a Big Ten championship game. He says, when is Corey going to figure out Mark will never speak well of a Hawkeye? Yes, this has never happened. Never, Mark. He will divert the conversation to any other player, school, than ever compliment Iowa. Am I wrong here? Um, Hater. In a word, yes. Uh, first of all, Gary Bar- Bartis lost spine. I, I have never seen your handle ever. So that doesn't mean you haven't watched a ton, but you obviously are not listening. 
I think I am extremely complimentary of Iowa football. I think I'm extremely fair of, I hope everyone. Um, I've been extremely complimentary of, I was just stating last week that Phil Parker is arguably the best defensive coordinator and defensive mind in the country. Now that's not me handing out compliments that are undeserved. He has earned every accolade. So I'm just stating the obvious, but that's still a statement. Uh, the defense and the special teams, extremely well coached. Uh, I mentioned on here how many times about Iowa's uh, entry of players into the NFL, uh, which is sixth or seventh or eighth in the NFL currently. I state that all the time. I've stated what just in the last few weeks I've talked about Iowa being currently, meaning right this second, and meaning in the last five to 15 years, tight end you. I think that's fairly complimentary to say it's the best football uh, tight end position um, program in the country over the last uh, 15 years. But it's also fairly obvious, right? We've debated on who's tight end you based on criteria, not based on a, a, a plain argument of, okay, who's tight end you over the past 10 years? There, there's no been no team that has produced – the number of high end tight end and NFL talent that's ended up producing at the level it has in Iowa. We've, we've done correct. I can't we've think of anyone. Before. Yeah. Penn state's had some good ones. Notre Dame's had some good ones. Miami really hasn't. I mean, Miami, what have they done in the last? Yeah. All time. I'm probably, or if you were going to go like last 40 or 50 years, I'm probably leaning Miami, but, uh, yeah, if we're talking the last 15 years, yeah, I'm not coming up with any. Now, the Ohio State tight end always goes to the NFL and plays in the NFL, but they're not like high-end guys. Sure. And they should because they're like four- and five-star kids. Yeah. They should play in the NFL. You know what I'm saying? Like, not saying that I would, ne I could never vote Ohio State tight end you if they were producing no. first round draft picks every year. They're but not I'm even close. Saying, yeah, And I was doing it mostly with three-star three, three star kids. <laughs> like the, yeah the ohio state tight end catches 15 pass he gets ignored and he catches like 12 passes but he gets drafted in the third or fourth round and plays in the nfl yeah That's, but again how much is that is, is, is the coaching staff developing these kids at all i think they're uh, developing them to be capable to nfl players oh, yeah sure. but but they're they're working with you know a, a top 10 tight end coming into Here's football. what's amazing about what I was done at tight end. Uh, George Kittle was a skinny dude who I think was a what two three star kid at the max coming out of high school. T.J. Hawkinson, Hawkinson was a I think he was from Carroll, if I'm not mistaken. Again, two three star kid. Noah Fant was a defensive end, good athlete, but I don't even know that he pro was projected as a tight end by a lot of schools. Um, I mean, just go down the list. It's just amazing what I was done with these lowly tight ends and that's why like I, I said this to grant leaper on the interview that was released here about a week ago like how what a dream come true for a young man like that who yeah he had he had opportunities to go to wake forest he had an opportunity to go to indiana um but like all of his other opportunities were basically g5 places and for him to get a late offer a scholarship offer now he's got a he's got a gray shirt so he's got to wait his turn but he got a late scholarship offer from Iowa. Man, I mean, that's got to be a dream. What better place as a known, I don't say no name tight end, but a very low ranked tight end to go than Iowa? Um, chances are um, you're almost, I'm not saying it's guaranteed, but you're probably 95% uh, possible that you go to Indiana as a, as a two to three star kid. And may have a good career there, may not, but he'll probably never play a snap in the NFL. Chances are, right? If you go to Iowa, what do those percentages move to? 60? 70? So, in other words, maybe a 40% chance that he ends up in the NFL. That's pretty impressive. Now, guys have, not everybody's panned out. Iowa's had guys that have left, and guy, you know, Sean Beyer, there was some hype around him, and you know, he played during a loaded time period as well. But for the most part, Iowa has they very rarely miss on tight ends. Uh, Gary Bart is lost by, and I'm regretting right now that I didn't play the 
satirical route in responding to your question because that's what I like to do. But I, I took it, I played it straight. So since I played it straight to start, I will invite you to please call me uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I take calls Monday, Wednesday, Friday on the main channel. Please call and and express your gripe. I don't understand it. I did find Corey. This is interesting. If it you know, anytime you find any kind of rankings, obviously the only value there is the knowledge and the information and the analysis of the person or people that put together the rankings, of course. But this comes from an outfit called College Football Saturdays, and they put together some kind of point system. Now, I'm not seeing what the point system is. I, I don't see the explanation for it. But they have ranked uh, each position over the last 10 years of college football and they have Iowa at number one with 310 points at tight end. Notre Dame's number two at 260. Penn State number three at 200. On down the line, the other Big Ten teams, Ohio State at seven and Michigan at 13. That's in the last 10 years, according to these people and whatever they're, I don't know what they're going by, but uh, that seems to be fairly accurate. So who are the, t- say that t- top three again. The top three in the last 10 years, Iowa, Notre Dame, Penn State. Yeah. Those are the first three that came out of my mouth and just off the yes. top of my head. Like I say, Miami's not, shouldn't be anywhere on that list. Uh, they did, who did Miami produce here a few years ago? Was it uh, not Pitts? Who did they produce here a couple of years ago at tight end that was a. Uh, David Njoku would be one who starts yeah, one. in Cleveland. Yeah, um, but good. Miami, if you go out, if you go out 25, 30 years, then you're starting to get serious with like guys that are going to get Hall of Fame consideration in the NFL, like Greg Olson and yes, Jeremy Shockey. Right. And right. but that's out. And, and, and I was doing that now. Right. They've got more. Miami's got more guys. I remember having this debate with your boy, Holson Holloway. Um, miss him, by the way, Mark. But um I remember talking about this because, yeah, there, there's no question. Miami has produced more Hall of Famers. But in 10, 15 years, we may say, eh, it's pretty much down the middle, and Iowa's got the, yeah. the momentum. Yeah, you know? Miami's got no one in the pipeline. Iowa's like got a lot of guys in the pipeline. Dallas Clark, is it fair to say George Kittle, with the trajectory of his career, is likely on his way to being that level of a player? Is that fair? Yes. Is it fair to say T.J. Hawkinson has a chance? Not saying he will be. He's had a good couple of years. He's got a chance. Sure. You know, and it sound, I saw a report a couple of days ago. It sounds like Sam Laporta has got a good shot of being tight end one on day one, Mark. <laughs> How about that? Uh, so, you know, uh, it, you know, just to be able to say, hey, Iowa's got four starting tight ends in the league, and they got Luke Lachey and Eric All both potentially coming out in a year. Now, with defensive back, I know you're proud of Iowa's performance defensive back uh, in the last 10 years. They've got Iowa at 17. And again, I'm just looking at a bunch of numbers, and I don't know what they mean. So I, I just see a bunch of numbers. I don't know if this is has anything to do with recruiting, performance on the field, what it means, NFL draft status, what it is. Yeah, and obviously I have less of a pulse on DBs. What are the schools ahead of them? Uh they're better in the defensive backfield in the last 10 years than 17th in the country. Uh, Alabama's number one, Clemson two, Michigan three, Ohio State four. Well, there's an issue right there. <laughs> Ohio yeah. State's had, had so much better defensive back play in the last 10 years than Michigan. It's not even like, all I don't those, know where this is coming from. But again, all those... Ohio State's so produced so many number one draft picks. This is where we can get a, a we can start debating about so semantics and whatnot because, and we did that last week. But uh, the bottom line is like all those schools you just named are bringing in four and five star kids at, the, at that position. I was not bringing in five star kids in any position, let alone defensive back. And so that's why what Iowa does at tight end at defensive back is so impressive and a linebacker because they're one of the few schools that's producing that level of NFL talent with. Uh, you, you, a lot of people would argue subpar recruiting. So what are the other schools? Keep going down the list. Who else recruits? Oh, I low switched level to quarterbacks. Uh, I can't find Iowa in the quarterbacks in the top 50. Really? 
Well, they haven't had the besides maybe, method, they haven't had any marks. So. Maybe I missed. And again, I don't even know what they're ranking here. I know what they're ranking, but I don't know what their criteria is. At quarterback, they've got Alabama and Ohio State tied for number one. Uh, what you want defensive back again? I want I want to hear what other schools ahead of Iowa and the defensive back uh, rankings that you would care about that, that, that don't recruit to the level of oh, the got program. you. Virginia Tech, okay, Maryland. Well, Maryland has produced a lot of good DBs, but I don't think they play as well as a group at the collegiate level as Iowa. That's not even close. And my guess is they recruit better. Yes. DB. Yeah, right? you're right. Uh, all of these schools recruit better, excluding maybe... Yeah, I'm on the defensive backs. Uh, Illinois. Where's Illinois? I've lost track of Iowa. Where's Iowa? And by the way, for the, the person in the chat who says, for the record, George is the only team to have a tight end selected in each of the last five drafts. Oh, okay. Wow. That, that, that's, that's, that's pretty cool impressive. <laughs> that's a cool stat, Mark. But again, they're getting, they're producing like the top, one of the top couple of, recruiting classes every single year so i'm not going to say well that's an impressive job of developing tight ends mark that's that would be the dumbest thing i could say i mean seriously what's more impressive a, a, a school that's producing a bunch of nfl tight ends that are two and three star kids at a high school or a team that's just giving five star four and five star kids a, a stepping stone to the league that's my I get your point. You're, I completely university. understand your point. You're arguing development over recruiting. Well, but recruiting is part of the process, too. We're part of what process? The, there's a process to recruiting. Yeah, I, yeah but I'm so saying if you're recruiting the best, then, you know, if, if, you, if you sign the number one quarterback in the country every year, let's yeah. say. Which is what Ohio State basically does, right? <laughs> Regardless, you you and and they turn out to fulfill their potential. Are you not quarterback? You, <laughs> I see. I I think that's why you have to start defining things because like we hear these thing we hear these terms that are tossed around that aren't really important. Ah, it's a DB factory or it's tight end. You, well, there's two different things. When I think of a DB factory or a player factory, they're being produced, developed at the factory. All right. You cannot tell me that that you know Georgia. I don't even know who these kids are. You could tell me probably all of them that have been drafted in the past five drafts. But you cannot they tell are, me that sure. they are a tight end factory because they've flipped four and five star kids and made them into third and fourth round draft picks. I'm sorry, that's just ridiculous. I, I based on the criteria, I guess that I'm working under. I'm feeling better about this site. I must have clicked on the wrong thing here. At defensive back, Ohio State's number one in the last ten years. I was going to say okay. I don't know what I clicked on. Ohio State's number one defensive back. And so Iowa might be better than where I had them. Now, this is this is screwed up. They've got Iowa 27th in defensive backs in the last time. Okay. By the way, for the for the Georgia fan in the chat who says, how can anyone say recruiting is not part of a head coaching job? I never said that. Did I ever say that, Mark? Did I ever no. say that recruiting was not part of a head coaching job? Come on. No, you were you are giving more weight and leverage, and I totally understand your point. I am not arguing against it. I'm just saying that it can be argued against. If a you kid are is giving a, a lot of weight to development, hang on just a second, and I'm giving more weight to what is the result, okay. regardless of how you get there. Yeah. I think it's what my point is. If I'm Grant Leaper, perfect example. If I'm Grant Leaper, two, three-star kid with few offers and I got an opportunity to go to Bama at the last second or go to Iowa, where am I going? Well, you're going to tell me Iowa. No, I don't want you to tell me where, where am I going? If I want a chance to go to the next level, where would you go? If you Alabama. have those opportunities, you would go to Alabama. You would go to Alabama as a two star tight end over Iowa. Are, are if you I can go to Alabama for what reason? For what reason? That doesn't mean that they can't develop NFL players at Alabama. I'm talking about history and resume, Mark, and reputation. Who is your, 
what reputation does Alabama have at developing two and three star tight ends and making them NFL players? They, well, they don't yeah. have those guys. Right. Exactly. So they haven't proven yeah, anything. I, I think it's kind of a dumb argument, but okay. Well, I'm not saying you're dumb. I'm not saying, I'm just saying it's just kind of a, <laughs> I, I, I think it's a, yeah. I, Recruiting I is absolutely a, a massive part of coaching. If it wasn't, then I, I Nick Saban and, and Dabo Sweeney and these, you know, these guys that recruit at high levels that you could argue they haven't proven anything because all they've done is turn five-star kids into five-star kids. I think development is underrated across the board, right? I think that's why, and that's why what's happened at Iowa has been so infuriating at certain skill position spots because they are so much better than most programs have proven to be at developing this position, this position, this position, and this position. Like they do it at multiple, it's not just tight end, it's DB, it's linebacker. And in the past, it seemed it was individuals along that offensive line. There's question marks there now, but uh, that that is a, a definitely a June debate, Mark. <laughs> well, I, I guess that um, there there is still development to be processed at those schools because you still have LSU, Texas, and others who recruit at a top five level that fail to develop. And here's yeah, that's true. And here's the other part about this. The other reason I'd pick Iowa if I'm Grant Leeper over Alabama, if I'm a two-star kid, well, two reasons. A, there's a good chance I'll never play at Alabama if I go there, right? Because I got five stars in front of me. Sure. And, you know, what what type of, uh, we, you know, it doesn't mean they can't develop guys, but they've already got five-star kids in front of them. They've got the leverage. What about the simple fact that sometimes five-star guys maybe have a, a bit of an attitude, right? They They carry a bit of a, I think that's an assumption. Well, it's, it is an assumption, but it's also human nature, Mark. It's also human nature. And, and you can't convince me for a second that the humility of guys like Jack Campbell and probably George Kittle and those guys, that that didn't play to Iowa's advantage and to their advantage because they came in feeling like they had a lot more to prove than the average five or four or five star kid who ends up going to a blue blood. See, I think Iowa uses that as did Mike D'Antonio at, at, uh, at Michigan State for years. Yeah. I, I wasn't really invested in the Leaper conversation, so I apologize. I kind of checked out and just gave a default answer. Wasn't really <laughs> invested or paying much attention in that whole thing. So I just went okay. Alabama. Anyway, uh, as we as we progressed here, uh, that's why I didn't have much of an argument because I was like, what are we, what are we talking about at this point? Um, We're talking about Grant Leaper, Mark. <laughs> yes, I understand that. But, but now you've moved on to, okay, so again, I'm not saying that you're wrong in your five star versus three star conjecture. I'm just saying that's what it is. It's conjecture. It makes sense that yes, when you're given everything and you are more talented than anybody on the field in high school and up through the ranks in these camps, that by human nature, yes, there is more likelihood that you were going to expect more work less those sorts of things than you do if you're being told you're not good enough you're not tall enough you're not fast enough and the human nature if you have it in you typically if, if you've been brought up a certain way responds to that yeah so i, I think that that's that's all i was saying <laughs> Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's almost like the trap game. I understand the concept of the trap game, and it may exist, but nobody's proven to me that the results mean anything. Is it also fair to say it's, it makes sense why a Georgia fan would place more emphasis on recruiting and why an Iowa fan would place more emphasis on development? Yes. <laughs> and it makes total sense why, even beyond that, that your development claim is more valid because you're talking about taking the talent and working with it to produce the final result rather than just having somebody show up on campus, throwing a helmet on their head and letting them run fast and catch footballs and score touchdowns without much input. I do think it's a little odd, Mark, that Iowa has not been able to land the big name tight ends. 
I mean, even here in recent years, since the Hawkinson Fant year, which you'd think, you know, that got so much publicity. Iowa landed at two mm-hmm. tight ends in the first round of the NFL draft. Yeah. That was an insane it is. accomplishment. And and they just had another guy who was drafted really high in Sam Laporta, who, like I say, is is getting a lot of hype as a, the next potential number one guy. They were able to lure. Uh, what what is so funny? <laughs> I'm just listening. You're yeah, absolutely they were, right. They were to, able to lure another guy and Eric All from Michigan over to Iowa, and he and Luke Lachey are are uh, you know projected to be, as you said, probably top five tight ends in the league and maybe the best duo in the country. I find it a little strange. They haven't been able to land the big name like a Mac Markway, right? I mean, he obviously was a, his dad played here, but it's hard to turn down blue bloods. I think that's what it comes down to. Even when you're playing for at a position that, you know, you look at a team like Iowa, man, why would you not want to come to Iowa if you're Mac Markway? But there are reasons. We looked at the wide receiver position for 2024, Let's look at the tight ends. I mean, I'm just thinking of who they've gotten in 23 and, tw- and 24, those two classes. Zach Ortworth was a three-star kid. Uh, Grant Leaper was like a two-star kid. Who am I missing? 23. Yeah, that's 23. That's, that's their 23 class, those two guys. So we see the commitments that have been made or the teams that are in play for these top tight ends in the country. Okay. There's a Penn state. Well, we see in Nebraska, but this makes sense because Carter Nelson is one of the few players in the state of Nebraska that actually the the state of Nebraska is not a great high school football playing state, but here they've got a really good one in Carter Nelson and he's a crystal ball to Nebraska. So they look to be in good shape there. Uh, And then we've got Penn state showing up at number six with a Connecticut player. Uh, we, we've got to start including in these conversations in the Big Ten, USC and UCLA, because they're going to be Big Ten players, and they've got a Georgia player going all the way across country to USC to play tight end. There's a Michigan commit out of Washington, the state of Washington, and another one out of the state of Michigan. Ohio State, now this is about the the I think Impressive. the sec, the second lowest rated player that they've gotten a commitment from. Iowa did like, offer Grant Steck. Oh, and okay. They, they pushed on him, I believe. So, yeah. So there, you've got a tight end out of Illinois who chooses Wisconsin over Iowa, and Wisconsin's produced really good tight ends, just not nearly as good as Iowa. USC, Ohio State, and Nebraska. So Nebraska is going to have a second tight end in the top 30 in this class. And then there's Gavin Hoffman at 34. And again, if we're, if, again, I know this is just speculation, Mark, and I mean, get off this topic because I see people in the chat are getting a little bit antsy. Uh, Who would you, if you're looking at a team, you know, in between 20 and 40, and you're, or I should say, players between that are ranked somewhere between 20th and 40th in the country. Yep. Whoops. Yeah. Who do you, what, which schools that have a chance at landing those kids would you trust more? Iowa or Louisville? I saw both of those schools landed uh, guys in that. Yeah. I mean, you probably, Cincinnati, die, right? Cincinnati, BYU, Iowa State, who obviously turned out a really good one a couple of years ago, and Charlie Kohler, but Northwestern. Well, they've had a couple good tight ends. No, they haven't. No, uh, they Northwestern haven't. has. Who? Uh, well, they had the... Um... <laughs> come on, come on, spit it out, you're, Mark. You're making me come up with the names that I can't <laughs> remember right now. Texas A&M has as well. But yeah, I'm going to Iowa. That's what I'm saying. Sure. So like, yeah, I don't absolutely. care that Gavin Hoffman's 34th in the country. When I watch him on tape, I'm, I, I really like what I see from him on tape. Here's a player out of Wisconsin who's chosen UCLA. Yeah. A tight end. Huh. Hmm. I don't know if Iowa offered, but. And like you said, what was one common theme with what Iowa's was done here recently at tight end and at several different positions is they have valued length. I mean, we talked about Devin Kennedy. who has got a seven foot wingspan. will be playing on the defensive line. I mean, they just landed two tight ends that are both six, six um, grant leaper, six foot six. I mean, 
those are some big dudes. And those two of those guys still have a year if they want to, you know, they're going to grow more. Um, so I, again, I, I don't know what it means other than I trust Iowa to uh, evaluate tight end talent. Who's doing the evaluations there. Is it Kirk? Is it Brian? I mean, they, they were developing tight ends before Brian, but Brian, I mean, let's be honest. I don't have any reason. Is there any reason to discredit what Brian Ferentz has probably done with the tight ends? I'm going to give him credit for that. He got here. He started coaching here in 2017, which was the coming out party for TJ Hawkinson. And then, and then of course, Noah Fant uh, kind of in the same year had Noah Fant was here in 2016. But w- when he took over as coordinator, I know he's not the position coach anymore, but he took over as coordinator. Those two guys evolved Sam Laporta and now what they've done. So I, I'm, I'm not going to give Abdul Hodge probably as much credit as I would Brian Ferentz because Brian Ferentz has been here since 17. Been been here longer than that. Been been the coordinator since 17. There's got to be a denominator. So basically, I was looking at, in regards to trying to jog my memory on Northwestern tight ends, one guy I was thinking of who's listed as a wide receiver. Shoot, I would consider him a tight end. But anyway, I was thinking of uh, Ben Skaronic. Where's he at? Uh, well, he's with the Rams right now. And then you also have Cameron Green, who was a really tight end, good tight end. So these knuckleheads who are like Northwestern, Northwestern, after I mentioned Northwestern, well, I'm looking at, you know, Cam Green caught 57 passes. He was a really good tight end three years ago. And, um, Again, Ben Skaronic, who's in the NFL. So, yeah. You just call me a knucklehead? No, I said these knuckleheads in the chat. Oh, well, I, I also s- scoffed at the idea of Northwestern. I, I'm not saying that they're producing the best tight ends in the country, but I said Northwestern has produced a few good tight ends in the last few years. And yes, they have. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm telling these people. We, let's have a debate on this for a second. And, and then if we want to, hit something before we uh uh if, if we want to hit something before El- before we're done fine but can we just ask let me ask you this simple question why hasn't minnesota been better on offense just very simple question over the last five to six years why can't they be better when they have guys like mo ibrahim and a laundry list of running back talent they have rashad bateman tyler johnson uh, uh chris ottman bell mm-hmm. i'm missing a guy in there that was really really good those are um, the three main ones. You've got these mammoths on your offensive line. You had uh, one of the best tight ends in the country last year. And uh, what was the kid's name? Croft or, you know, what I'm talking about. Um, why can't they be better on offense? I mean, that type of talent, they got to be electric. I'm Is making things up. I haven't made anything up. For anybody who wants to debate me on any of these topics, please call me. <laughs> I, I beg for people to call me. I'm debating you, Mark. Tell me why Minnesota can't be better on offense. Okay. Well, that this is not a, a debate I asked for, uh, but that's a that's a good comment right there. I just I just clicked randomly on the chat just to put something up there, uh, but Ed Rogers actually hit it. Well, there's one right there. Aside from Tanner Morgan's 2019 season, 30 touchdowns, seven picks, uh, he's been a below average quarterback. So and that's so one problem. Question. Why haven't they went to the transfer portal? Like, like that's a fair question. Just like with Iowa, like, did they? Now, the difference with Minnesota is he did. Tanner Morgan did have the one exceptional year. Yeah, he's really good. Spencer Petrus, I love you, Spence. Never had that type of a year. So it makes almost less sense for Iowa because you think, well, maybe Tanner's got it in him. Tanner dealt with some injuries. And beyond. Mo Ibrahim, they have been deep at running back. They went through five running backs two years ago because they kept getting hurt, and every one ran for 100 yards. It didn't matter who they put in the game. It's, it's a machine. They are a machine at running back, and they're a machine at wide receiver. And one of them went to, to the Pac-12, Bucky Irving, and went and became an all-conference player and ran for 1,000 yards last year at Oregon. Minnesota was 65th in the country in total offense last year. That's you guys would would kill for that. Kill for that. <laughs> yes, but I'm just saying they have had 
really, I mean, not just compared to Iowa, Mark. They have had really good talent. They've had NFL talent. They've got guys who are in the NFL. And Mo Ibrahim, I don't know how that got. Didn't he go undrafted? Yes. That's absurd. I don't know who picked him up. Somebody who picked him up. I don't care what knee injuries he's dealt with. To not take a late flyer on Mo Ibrahim is insane to me. Absolutely insane. But like you said, they've developed guys behind him. Um, and they've, they've got guys, they, frankly, they've had good guys on defense. They've had good NFL production over the last 10 years. Did you read 65th in offense or did you just look that up? I just looked it up. Oh, will you, will you do me a favor if that stat is available on the same page? Does it have yards per play? Because my one theory about this would be that Minnesota plays to its defense. Minnesota, over the last, outside of that one big year with Tyler Johnson, Rashad Bateman, and uh, Tanner Morgan, at quarterback, where they they opened things up with Kirk Sharaka as the offensive coordinator, they have run the ball. There were two seasons during P.J. Flex's run here of 29 and 10 in the last three full seasons, by the way, where um, – <laughs> They have run the ball more than anyone in the country outside of service academy. So what this does is this limits your number of plays and it plays to your strength on defense. So if you run yes. less plays, you're going to produce less offense. So that's what that's what Brian Ferentz, Kirk Ferentz and company want you to believe is the case at Iowa. It's not, but that's what they want to, right? That's what they want you to believe. That's what they want you to believe. But yards per play answers that. So Minnesota averaged... 5.87 yards per play. Where did that rank in the country? Let's see if I can do this. Uh, that ranked. I and by the way, while Corey's looking this up, anyone who runs a website that has like 100 teams listed and doesn't put the rank next to the team, shame on you. You should always put the rank so you don't have to count it. Yeah, they don't put the rank. I got to count it. Um, that ranks. Where is it? Yards per play. What did I say again? 5.8. Yeah, apparently I can't do that on here. Am I am I losing my mind? I, it won't let me do it because the rankings show up on different pages. So when I sort by ranking, it's only sorting the top 50 ranked yeah. let me in try. total offense. So I can't actually look at yards per play. Uh, not on the NCAA website. I can't do it on the NCAA website, Mark. <laughs> is that not most the dumbest thing you've ever heard of? It is. 49th. Okay. I go to CFB stats. So Very good. I was just making my point that they are a little bit better. 65th bit. up to 49th. 49th in total offense in terms of yards per play. I'm just saying, don't you think they've had top 25 level of offensive skill talent? It, well, just offensive talent. Again, going back to the offensive line. In the past five to 10 years, they have had above average offense. No, 49th is above average, but I'd say probably closer to top 25, top 30 offensive skill talent. I get your point. I, I think you're stretching it a bit in regards to how much they've underachieved. What do you mean? They haven't won a single Big Ten West title. Their defense is good every year. Do you, do you want me to name West all West. the teams I would take offensive talent over Minnesota? Yes. In the, in the, in the West Division? Yes. They haven't made oh, it. Oh, in the West game. Division? I'm talking they about in college the football. They haven't made the championship game one time. Once. They haven't made the championship game one time, Mark. I, I mean... Who in the who in the West has had better skill position, better offensive talent as a whole than Minnesota? I dare you, there's not one team in the West. Well, not yeah, you've suddenly narrowed the argument down to the Western Division. Well, no, I'm saying they've not made a single sure. West Division championship. Although during that time, they've arguably been either they or Iowa have been the best team overall, but there's always been somebody one team to elevate past them each of those seasons. They, what do you mean they or Iowa? What does that mean? That since 2019, what is that? How many years? 19, 20, 21, 22, five seasons, four to five seasons that Minnesota and Iowa have had the best teams overall. But in individual seasons, Minnesota, you could have the best you could have the best record in a conference over the span of 10 years, but not win a championship. You're telling me Minnesota's right? record in the last five years. Yes. You're telling me Minnesota's record over the last five years is better than Wisconsin's. Uh, since 2019. 
Oh, oh well, okay, then that's narrowing it down a little bit. Well, that was uh, PJ's second season, and that's when they got it going. Okay. All right. So what's our point here that Minnesota is underachieved on offense based on the amount of talent? I think if there's, yeah, I think if there's like, if, if you were to ask me what's one other comp, one other, one other team in this conference that if I was a member of that fan base, I'd be pulling my hair out. It might be Minnesota. Cause man, I'd be looking at the situation, Mark saying we're losing divisions next year and we haven't done anything. We haven't made one title. We produced all the skill position talent. You could argue it's the same thing with with Iowa fans looking at all the defensive talent they produced and the tight ends, and they can't do anything. Although at least Iowa's won a couple of division titles since they've uh, formed the divisions. That's what I, if I'm a Minnesota fan, that's what I'm thinking. And now we got to go to a, a divisionless format and hope that we can get that type of skill position talent and, and offensive talent in general that we weren't able to win with before. Like I'd be pulling my hair out if I'm a Minnesota fan. Br- bring that redhead guy on here. Where's the redhead guy? He, he, what's his name? What's his name? What's the redheaded guy? Oh, uh, Daniel House. Daniel, he's yes. great. Bring him on here, and I want to know what he thinks about this. What What's interesting about what you bring up, and this will actually accentuate your point in a strange way, is Iowa, at least you know what's wrong. The offense sucks. <laughs> Every position unit has underachieved except tight end or just flat out sucks. And the offensive coordinator (laughs) doesn't know what the hell he's doing. So at least, you know what it is with Minnesota, actually with, with these very good offenses, or at least from a personnel standpoint, their defenses have been good too the last few years. Now they've had some crap special teams. I'm thinking back to 2020. Didn't they have like, didn't they lose a bunch in 2020? This is anecdotal evidence, yes. but 2020 is a fifth of the sample size of the last five years. Didn't they have like no kickers left at one point? Yes. I just remember them having serious issues on special teams and special teams is a, a big aspect of the game. So maybe that's where they've been bad. Yeah. They were number nine in total defense last year. Oh, well, part of that's elevated because of the division that they, they yeah, just like the rest of them. Yeah. Iowa was two. Illinois was three. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think we can both agree Iowa's a, a Iowa's one of the best still. I mean, oh sure, Iowa and Illinois probably to it, but it's just like where, where did Rutgers end up? When Rutgers was playing nobody early, they were like a top five, top ten defense in the country, and I'm guessing they ended up like outside the top thirty. Well, yeah, they ran into a few teams in their oh, division. Well, they <laughs> finished thirty eight. Yeah, so um, once you start playing more electric teams. Um, but I give Iowa credit. They they held Kentucky to zero. Yeah. <laughs> now, but Kentucky didn't have their running back or their quarterback, but yeah. they did hold them to zero. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen that game full personnel. I still think Iowa was better, but not by much. Let me ask you this, Mark. Let me take it. There's a crazy idea to finish off our show. Crazy idea. Let me tell you what you think. We have spring games across the country. Teams play themselves. How would you feel about we can call it a spring game or a summer game. I haven't even said anything about Iowa for a half hour. We've been talking about other teams. <laughs> for anybody listening to the podcast, Mark's looking at the, the chat right now. Yes. Anyways, let's, let's look at, let's just play imagination for a second, Mark. So either a spring or a summer game. And if you're a program that has sucked and a team that needs help, needs help with recruiting, needs help with exposure, all these things like a Rutgers. What do you think about Rutgers and Kansas? Or, or maybe Kansas took a big step forward last year. Maybe Rutgers and uh, give me another trash program, Arizona. Sure. Who do you think those two programs saying, we're going to play a spring game? And, or, or, or say two teams from the same conference, we're going to play a spring game and we're going to put it on national television. Do you think that would be successful and would it be worth the risk of injury, et cetera, for playing a game during the middle of the year, not during the season that means nothing? Yes to the first part of your question. No to the second part of your question. It's not worth it. What are you proving? You're going to show Spark. recruits. You're going to have to play a game in the spring when you don't want to. Well, but I get your point. Yeah. I, I think it's an interesting idea. It wouldn't have to be a yearly thing, right? But it would get like how many how many viewers does an average? Let, let's just ask this: How many viewers does an average Rutgers versus Maryland game get during the season? What network is it on? Is it on the Big Ten Network? 
Yeah, because it's not going to be on any of the yeah, FS1 it's, or it's gonna be, Yeah, it's going to get uh, 600,000 views. Okay, that's, that's quite a bit. But let's think about it, uh, in comparison to if Rutgers and Maryland played in May. People are starting for football. Yeah, if you throw that on ESPN on a Saturday afternoon throw in May. On, throw, it on, throw it on CBS. Wherever. Throw it on the big, so if, if what, how many views do you think it'd get? How many viewers? Triple that. Triple? Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm saying. So I don't know. Well, there's no worth... competition for one thing. I know. So that's what I'm saying. Is it you're still thinking it's not worth it even with that amount of I mean I'm trying to think what you would gain out of that. Well, c- couldn't you market it? Couldn't you market the network and advertising and all that stuff to make the schools more money? And I don't know how much one game would make you, but Yeah, you can make money. Yes, you would make money. And then you and then that you take that money and 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 you translate it into well you can't make it you can't make that nio money. Is Rutgers really is Rutgers really hurting for money? They're making more money in TV revenue than uh, any team in the country outside of the Big Ten. So there are th- this is an interesting conversation because there are NCAA rules that prohibit student athletes from competing in uh, events outside of their university's sports. And the reason this I, I bring this up is because Brad Heinrichs of the Iowa Swarm brought it up because there's going to be a men's and women's basketball game. I think in Des Moines, they're trying to set this up right now through the Swarm, and they had to get permission from the university to do it because of those NCAA rules. Hmm. If there were a way around that, and you could have a non-NCAA sanctioned game in May or June that strictly uh, built NIL revenue, and somehow these collectives could make deals with these networks and they could work in conjunction. Think about the money that could go directly to collectives. Okay. Well, there you brought in another factor that could really benefit this. I don't know this. how feasible it is, but... Because, yes, you're then funneling the the money to the players and making it worthwhile for the players, both the current players and the future players, to say, hey, I go there and I get a $18,000 paycheck for playing a game in May. Exactly. Or whatever. Yeah. So I don't know how it would 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 work unless the NCAA unless they were able to get by with that rule. And the other question is, would I mean, like, would they have to basically not wear their university uniforms? I mean, like, would they have to go under different? You know what I'm saying? Like, because yes. they're they can't represent the university and and be playing for NIL money. But there's, I wonder if that kind of thing isn't coming. Like, well, there's already talk, as you well know, there was a lot last spring about certain coaches coming out. I think Hugh Freeze was one, a couple other big time coaches that said we should be playing a, a scrimmage in the spring. Yeah. Um, this is going to be a dumb response on the surface, but when you think about it, people care about laundry. So that would matter. As Seinfeld once said, you know, you're rooting for laundry. So people would care that Rutgers in Kansas wouldn't have their uniforms on. There's ways you could do there. There are ways you could promote that. And you could just have Rutgers wearing all scarlet and you could have Kansas wearing all blue. Yeah. And or they could look like NASCAR cars and they could just wear advertisements yeah yeah think about that think about that yeah you just wouldn't know who to throw the ball to that would be the problem the money that would add that money on to top of the tv revenue Mm -hmm. i don't know it's kind of an interesting dynamic but the big the big uh wrench that would be thrown into it is the rules that the ncaa still has in place i hated this at the time when I was a little kid, but then I grew to enjoy it or kind of embrace it. Do you remember all the all-star games uh, at the end of the college football season where the players would put all the logos of the different teams on yeah. their helmet? At first that drove me nuts because I'd see my Ohio state players. and I'd be like, how dare you put <laughs> logos of other teams on your helmet? But then I kind of embraced it. You know, they're a teammate for, you know, the week. And so they, they mix it up there. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to send this segment over to Brad Heinrichs and see what he has to say. 
like I said, that I, my just thinking about the future would not be surprised if something like that ends up happening. And I don't know that it'd be good for the sport or not, but it would. You know, it would create. You know, people would watch. Like, believe me, Mark, I'm watching that game. I'm watching that oh, game too. On a Sunday night, on a sat, whatever night, you could put it in. You could put it on Monday night. I don't care. Like, you would make money off of that, and it would be. I, I mean, it could produce unbelievable money. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, smiles per gallon says the whole premise is ridiculous and he can't believe Mark, you keep humoring this. So uh, hum humoring me on this Mark. So uh, smiles per gallon, put me in my place, Mark. I guess I'm just going to go crawl and get in the fetal position and cry myself to sleep, Mark. So it's been fun. <laughs> but we will not humor him with uh, posting his comment because we got Jason's here that says, Mark, I liked your completely biased big 10 top 10 wide receivers video. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think Jason's poking the bear a little bit because you would have to see the top 10 and it would be obvious if you know some things, but they have earned those positions. It's funny how that bias though, Jason somehow didn't leak into the running backs video. Did it? Okay. <laughs> Hard and to argue. You might with. be surprised who I ranked as the number one running back in the Big Ten. Hard to argue with what Michigan's done at that position. Is that fair to say? As biased, yeah. you can be as biased as you want. It's kind of hard to argue. Yeah, and and I take my bias out of it. That's why I ranked them appropriately. Although I do think Ohio State's got a deeper running back room. All right, Corey, thank you so much for doing this. As always, we appreciate everybody being here. We get together, Corey and myself, every Tuesday at 4.30 Central. So we appreciate you being here. Come on back next week and uh, bring some friends with you, and we will talk it up. Uh, and, of course, join Corey each and every day over at uh, from the Hawkeye of the Storm. All right, Corey, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Talk to you in July.